Tad. I don't, I don't know. It's just it's crazy. Okay. Well, then it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, um, Ted Chinberg. So please. Well, I've always wanted to start a math talk by saying good morning, Vietnam. Um, so my talk is about um, some work with Brett Hemingway, Nadia Heminger, and um, Zach Scher. And it's about a tool that we hope will be useful in cryptography, um, capacity theory. So the use of capacity theory came up when I heard a talk by Nadia. What it enables you to do is deter determine whether there are some auxiliary polynomials that you might like to use for a cryptographic application. So I'm going to give one illustration of this technique, but we're hoping that other people may have some auxiliary polynomials they're looking for, and that capacity theory will help determine whether they're there or show they're not there. So now I hope this will work. Which do I click? Before I click at random, I wanted to know something about what I do. Okay, that one, okay. Great. So the example I want to use to illustrate how capacity theory is relevant is a theorem of Coppersmith that's about 20 years old. So Coppersmith proved this very nice theorem. Um, suppose you take a monic polynomial of some degree d and some large positive integer n. Uh, and what he looked for were solutions, small integers that are solutions of the congruence f of m congruent to 0 mod capital N. So what P Coppersmith proved was that there was a polynomial time algorithm in log n and d for finding all the integers that both do two things. They have to solve the polynomial congruence, f of m congruent to 0 mod n, and further, they're small in the sense that their absolute value is less than n to the 1 over d. So by now, this is a fairly famous theorem. Uh, there's many, many papers about it in the literature improving uh, methods of showing it. Uh, and since Coppersmith first proved it, uh, there's been a question about whether you can improve the upper bound on the size of m. So the, quest, the main question was whether you can increase n to the 1 over d to something like n to the 1 over d plus epsilon for some positive epsilon. Now, it was, it's not hard to prove that if n is a big power of a single prime, uh, there's no way to do this improvement because there's just too many solutions. There's exponentially many solutions in some cases. But it was an open question of what if you have an RSA modulus, if n is a product of two distinct primes that are large, can you improve uh, this? And Coppersmith made some speculations in his first paper about some possible methods, but it's been kind of open, I think, for 20 years, uh, whether his method could be souped up. And the main thing we found was that actually there's no hope. So. Uh, the reason that you can't improve it is the auxiliary polynomials of the shape he looks for simply don't exist. You can prove they don't exist. So one can think of this as a negative result, but I want to emphasize also that the technique I'm going to describe gives positive results. It also tells you if I'm looking for auxiliary polynomials of a certain shape, it'll tell you if they're there or not, and then it's up to you to go find them. So let me talk about the uh, auxiliary polynomials that Coppersmith used. So what he did was to use the LLL algorithm to find a polynomial with rational coefficients that has this shape. It's an integral combination of products of x to the i with f of x over n to the j. Now, it's important to realize here that the aijs are integers, but this polynomial will have denominators in its coefficients because you're dividing by n. You take f of, f of x over n. Well, he found a polynomial of that shape that's not zero, but which was bounded in absolute value in a big disk, bounded in absolute value less than one in the disk of radius n to the 1 over d. 
Okay? And the question is, why is this useful? I mean, how do you prove his theorem using this? If you can find that h of x quickly, well, remember what he was looking for were all of the integers m that solved the polynomial congruence and that had absolute value less than n to the 1 over d. So first of all, let's look at the consequence of having f of m congruent to 0 mod n. If I plug in x equals m in the formula for h of x in equation 1, well, f of, f, f of m over n, that's an integer. Right? And certainly m is an integer. And so since all of the aijs are integers, you get that the value of this polynomial at little m is an integer, even though that they're denominator, they're things that the denominators are the coefficients. On the other hand, you're looking for an integer uh, m that's of absolute value less than 1 over d, and we know the value of this polynomial h of z at any z in that big disk is less than 1. So the value of little h on m is an integer of absolute value less than 1, and there's not very many of those. Okay? So now you've got an honest auxiliary polynomial where you know all the integers m's you're looking for are zeros of that. And there's a quick method for finding zeros, actual zeros of polynomials with actual coefficients. So this was Coppersmith's brilliant idea uh, to, that you could convert the problem of finding such a polynomial into a problem, problem of finding a small uh, non-zero vector in a lattice. And I'm not going to review that translation, but you can imagine it's somehow not that implausible you could do it. So the question for us was, are there polynomials that look like this, but for which equation two can be improved? You can get them absolute value less than one for all z in a slightly bigger disk, n to the one over d plus epsilon. That's the issue. And this is what we prove. Uh, we prove that uh, they're not there. There's no way to do it. So if you take your monic polynomial and you look for an auxiliary polynomial of the shape that Coppersmith was searching for, um, and you want it to have absolute value less than one for all z in a slightly bigger disk, for an epsilon bigger than zero, it does not exist. And uh, capacity theory is a really powerful tool in the sense that can prove that things don't exist. It can also tell you when they're there. Um, and I find the, the interesting thing is that the arithmetic geometers were working hard in this direction, but they never thought of using LLL. Okay. So the cryptographers, who were incredibly clever, we're realizing there's another problem. Not only do these polynomials exist, how do you find them? Okay, so they realized that LLL was the way to do it. So eventually, I think the two directions of research are going to combine. I mean, people, there are going to be some new, new books written. Um, okay, so let me talk about how capacity theory is useful, and I hope other people will think of uses for it. Okay, so here was the classical problem um, that goes back to the 19th century. Um, if you look at a compact subset of the complex plane uh, that closed under complex conjugation, um, we're interested in finding polynomials with integer coefficients that are not zero, that have soup norm less than one on this set. Now, capacity theory gives you a numer numerical criterion for finding them. And it's a very natural construction. Um, look at the polynomials of degree up to n. That's a real vector space of dimension n plus 1. And inside there, we've got a certain subset, namely the polynomials with real coefficients of that bounded degree, whose soup norm on your compact set is less than 1. Now, that will be a convex symmetric set. Um, it's symmetric in the sense you multiply a polynomial by minus 1, stays in there. And it's convex in the sense that, you know, the line segment between two polynomials that you get by averaging between the two polynomials, so that'll be entirely contained in the set if you started with two in the set. So we're in a classical situation from um, the geometry of numbers. We have a convex symmetric subset of a big Euclidean vector space. And in, in geometry of numbers, you're very interested in the volume of that. And we want to know the vo how the volume grows as n goes off to infinity. That's what capacity theory measures. So the definition of the sectional capacity, which is gamma of E, you define it via its, its logarithm, and it's this limit of minus 2 times the log of the Euclidean volume of that set over n squared. So the point is here, um, OK, let's go on here. I'll talk about what the main theorem is. Paqueta and Zago uh, in the 20s and 50s proved the following theorem 
that if you have a, this compact subset of the complex plane and you're looking for non-zero polynomials with integer coefficients that have soup norm less than one on it, the capacity determines whether those exist. At least if the capacity is less than one or greater than one. If it's capacity exactly equal to one, that's a very interesting problem. You don't have an answer. But if the capacity is less than one, then in some sense, this volume is large of polynomials with uh, soup norm one, and you can find an integer lattice point. And that's in some sense why you get this polynomial. Now, if the capacity on the other hand is big, a much deeper theorem is that there is no such polynomial. That's actually harder, it's significantly harder. And that was due to Sago actually. Uh, the reason that people worked on this was that they were very interested in whether, given this compact set, can you find infinitely many algebraic integers that have all their conjugates in the set. If the capacity is less than one, it means the set's small, and it's fine, hard to find algebraic integers that have all their conjugates in the set. And if its capacity is large, you can at least say every time you take an open subset of the plane that contains your set, it contains infinitely many complete sets of conjugates of algebraic integers. But what we're really after is this statement about auxiliary polynomials, because that's the kind of thing that Coppersmith needed. Um, let me just make one little comment about the first part of the theorem. Why is this natural? That if the capacity is less than one, there should be a non-zero polynomial with soup norm less than one. And this is just a very nice example of Minkowski's theorem, as I mentioned. Uh, suppose we have the capacity less than one. Inside r to the n plus one, I have this integer lattice of polynomials with integer coefficients. And Minkowski says that I'm going to find a non-zero element of this lattice that is in my convex symmetric set of things that have soup norm less than one, provided the volume of that is big enough. And the volume growth now is measured by capacity. Uh, the log of the volume is approximately minus n squared over the log of the capacity. So if the capacity is less than one, the negative of this log is positive. And so the log of the volume is growing like n squared times a positive number. And n squared times something positive is eventually gonna beat a linear function of it. And so eventually Minkowski's theorem applies. So the first part of the figure del Sego is quite naive. It just is an easy Minkowski argument. The other part is deeper, much deeper actually. Um, but I'm not gonna be able to talk about those techniques. That uses a lot of um, real analysis, in fact. Okay, so let's see what happens when we try to take this idea and apply it to Coppersmith's theorem. Okay, so in the Fichetta Zegum theorem, we started, we were looking for a polynomial that was not zero, that had soup norm less than one on a compact set. Now, Coppersmith is looking for something different. He's looking for a polynomial with rational coefficients we want it to have absolute value less than one on a big disk, but um, it's, it definitely doesn't have integer coefficients, so we can't apply capacity theory directly. But there is a fact that any such polynomial has, namely, if you look at that form in equation three, if I take a z such that z is an algebraic integer and f of z over n is also an algebraic integer, when you look at the right-hand side of equation three and you plug z in for x, the right-hand side will all be algebraic integers. So the value of h of z is an algebraic integer whenever both z and f of z over n are algebraic integers. And um, this is something now that we can generalize capacity theory to deal with, to ask whether there are polynomials of the shape we want. And so here's our problem. When is there a non-zero polynomial with rational coefficients it's got to have soup norm less than one on some compact set, like a gigantic disk. But we want it to have the property that it's an algebraic integer whenever I substitute in a z that's an algebraic integer so that f of z is concrete to zero mod n in the ring of all algebraic integers, meaning that f of z over n is also an algebraic integer. And it turned out that Cantor, David Cantor and Bob Rumley developed a capacity theory that exactly answers that kind of question. So let me just, it's gonna be, I don't wanna to spend too much time on the technical part, but just let me say it's a natural thing for an arithmetic geometry to say this, that if you have constraints that involve subsets of the complex plane, that's fine, but for arithmetic geometers, you think the complex numbers are just the algebraic closure of one completion of the rationals. We've got the p-adic numbers and their algebraic closure, 
So we might as well consider p-adic conditions as well as Archimedean conditions on a polynomial. So what Cantor and Rumley did was treat all the places of the rationals equally, and they developed a capacity theory that enables you to decide when there's a polynomial with rational coefficients that's got p-adic absolute value that's small on some p-adic set, and which has co uh, complex absolute value small on some subset of the complex numbers. It's a natural thing to do, just treat all the places equally. And if their capacity is bigger than one, there is no such rational function. And it, there is no such polynomial. This was a very nice development that people were just pursu pursuing theoretically, but it turns out to be exactly what one needs. Um, this is a little more technical, but what you need to do in the Coppersmith uh, application is you need to pick these subsets of the algebraic closure of the p-adic numbers and of the complex plane in a sensible way. In the complex plane, the E sub infinity is just your big disk of some radius t. t is a varying parameter. And for all the primes, you simply take the inverse image under your monic polynomial of degree d of a certain p-adic disk. The p-adic disk of radius, the absolute value then with respect to the p-adic absolute value. And when you look for a polynomial that's p-adically bounded on all those EPs and has absolute value less than one on E infinity, it's exactly the same as looking for the kind of polynomial we wanted, one that is an algebraic integer at every algebraic integer, so that f of z over n is an algebraic integer, and which has absolute value less than one on the disk of radius t. So now you use uh, Cantor and Rumley's book, and you calculate the capacity of the adelic set that has those components, and you find out, miraculously, it's t times n to the 1 over d. So saying that it's less than 1 is exactly the same as saying that the disk that you're dealing with is radius less than n to the 1 over d. If the disk is bigger, their theorem says there is no such problem. Right? So that's why you can't improve on Coppersmith's theorem, um, at least not by the same auxiliary polynomial technique. Um, now, Coppersmith made a number of suggestions about how you might improve his n to the 1 over d bound. And one of his observations was very clever, as usual. Uh, he said, look, we're looking for rational integers, not algebraic integers. We're looking for rational integers uh, that satisfy this congruence and are small. And so he looked at binomial polynomials. Now, if you take a binomial polynomial, it has honest denominators, but every time you evaluate it at an integer, you get an integer, because binomial coefficients are integers. And so there's a famous theorem, actually, of Polya that says if you take a polynomial with rational coefficients and it takes integer values at every integer, it's an integer combination of binomial polynomials. That's a useful thing to know. And so Coppersmith said, well, look, maybe we can look for more auxiliary functions. We look for auxiliary functions that are integer combinations of a binomial polynomial, b sub i of x, times the value of a binomial polynomial, b sub j, on f of x over n. So that's a much bigger class of polynomials. And the natural question is, can you find that type of function that's bounded by one in a large disk? And when we first thought about this, we thought, oh, well, okay, we're probably gonna prove they're not there. In fact, they're there. You can find a polynomial that looks just like that with integer coefficients, non-zero, that's got soup norm less than one on a disk of arbitrary size, okay? But they're not useful because their degrees are too big, right? When we first saw this, it was kind of a shock. You can, you can actually write them down. But their degrees are too big to be useful. Let me try to explain that. And this is the last theorem I'll talk about. So we're trying to find a polynomial that looks like the one Coppersmith was after, uh, which has soup norm less than one on some disk of radius n to the one over d plus epsilon. But the bottom line in this theorem is saying that um, if you have any polynomial that looks like that, where the total degree is bounded by n to the epsilon times a factor, in a sense, small degree polynomial, if that polynomial were to exist, the integer n already has to have a small prime factor. Okay. So it's kind of like you know, they're tempting you. Someone is tempting you, saying, you know, there is this thing, but if you try to reach for it, you're going to get burned because um, it's too big. If you could find such a thing that was useful, you could have already looked for a small prime factor of it. Right? It wouldn't, wouldn't have helped. 
This is a much more interesting computation in capacity theory, and it used some results about distribution of primes. Uh, so, okay, so I don't want to be too negative. Let me finish with a few other comments about what one can do with this kind of technique. Um, okay, so there's the archive paper. Um, this is the summary of what I've been talking about. Uh, you can't use the same method as Coppersmith to improve this. But let me say a few things that we're working on now. Um, there's a famous theorem, again, of Coppersmith, that says that if you have an integer n that's a product of two big primes that are distinct, and you know one of the, say, the larger of the primes to within the end of the quarter, then there's a quick algorithm right, to finding both primes. And we can prove now that the end of the one, the one quarter is actually best possible. You can't, by the same method, you can't improve one quarter. Uh, but just the last two days, <laughs> we've been working on another problem. Namely, suppose you know n, and that it's a product of p and q, and somebody tells you some of the digits of p. Maybe not the leading digits, but some clumps of digits. Capacity theory will tell you exactly when you can find an auxiliary polynomial that will spot those p's, depending on where the clumps are. It's a very interesting calculation. And a miracle was happening the last few days. So we have to see if the miracle is stable. Um, the other thing we're talking about here is this technique has to do with single variable polynomials. Uh, but it also applies to bivariate polynomials. And people have looked at Coppersmith's paper. He has very nice results about algorithms for finding exact uh, solutions of a polynomial in two variables equal to zero at two integers that are bounded. Um, and capacity theory is ideally suited for that problem as well. Um, but then when you get into more variables or solving polynomial equations in many variables modulo divisors where the solutions are not zero, then you get into a new territory, which is current research in capacity theory is very much involved in. It's, higher dimensional capacity theory is uh, in the process of being developed. And I think cryptography gives a fantastic motivation for developing it. Um, and so I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Ted? Stephen. I had to get in quick to be daddy. Um, I was uh, interested in the, where the sort of shape of n comes into this. I couldn't really see in, in what you presented why, how you could get arguments to customize on when the n was p times q or... Well, in the fact, in the proofs, it doesn't matter at all. But in the end, it did because in this theorem here about binomial polynomials, it came up. And the reason that it comes up is the method in capacity theory says I'm going to define these subsets of the algebraic closure of QP for every prime P and at infinity, okay? And you want to have, you want to show that um, this, you want to determine this capacity. Now, when you write down that auxiliary collection of sets, if you want to try to prove this kind of result that there does not exist a polynomial of small degree that does the job, in this particular case, the prime factorization of n matters because if n is divisible by, is not divisible by small primes, you can take a bigger set for those, for all the small primes. As soon as you take a bigger set at all the small QP bars, then the capacity will go up and you, know, you have more constraints on when the polynomial exists. So in other words, to prove this theorem, we had to take into account something about the factorization of n if there were small primes, uh, if there were no small primes, then we could get a better capacity theory application. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Are there some more questions here? Um. It's a, a very naive question. I have a nice compact set uh, stable by conjugation. How do I go about computing its capacity? Is there a nice formula for this? Oh, yes, there's lots of formulas. In fact, if you look at Rumley's book, Springer Lecture, Lecture Notes in Math, 1989. Uh, he's got you know, chapters on how to do this. I mean, it's a, it's a nice topic. The other thing I should say is that it's a non-trivial, you know, cap capacity is a volume calculation, okay? And what Coppersmith did was to change the volume Minkowski argument into finding a small uh, non-zero lattice point in a, in a convex set. 
And that's a non-trivial, that's a non-trivial step. Right? So there's more to be done. Okay, I just have a question. Um, so, uh, in um, in your results, um, do, do you use the the, the fact that uh, that n is a is a product of of, of two primes? Not at all. So, so except it could be the, because because it could be conceivable that indeed, as as you were mentioning, that uh, um, Copernicus result could be improved, but without using uh, this uh, auxiliary. Um, Oh, polynomial, yes. right? Because yes, absolutely. If if n is just prime, then it right. is it is possible, absolutely, right? Exactly right. And he didn't talk about that. But for special n's like n equals primes, there's quick ways to find yeah. zeros. But this, all we prove is that there are not the auxiliary polynomials of the shape he used. Mm. There could be a very different method of solving this problem. But could could the um, capacity theory some some somehow be built to apply to? Uh, uh, I don't know. Have you have you found? Um, that, that you can maybe use some other kind of auxiliary um, uh, polynomials, not, not, not of the shape of uh, Yeah, you can start mates. doing that. I mean, that's a very natural question, and I think that's one of the reasons I like talking to cryptographers, because it's going to you know, give a great impetus to try to develop different techniques for finding auxiliary polynomials of different shapes. What Rumley and Cantor did was they looked at arbitrary rational functions on curves, this theory only has to do with protective line in one variable, but if you want to do bivariate polynomials, you're probably going to be working on curves. So, in other words, uh, yeah, I, there certainly could be other auxiliary types of auxiliary functions, possibly many variables, that could be useful. And we need to develop the capacity theory to determine whether they're there. Yeah. I don't see any further questions, so please join me in thanking Ted again. <laughs> <laughs>